We often hear in mainstream media how young people leave the province, how there's no opportunities for young people to work in New Brunswick, and how there's nothing to do here. Well, today's guest is going to blow all those misconceptions right out of the water. Sally Ang brings energy, ideas, enthusiasm, and already a certain degree of experience on a culture for this province that is, let's get it done, let's get going, let's have some fun doing it. Hope you enjoy the interview with Sally Ng. Please share, please support, and thanks for watching. And now, Sally Ng. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Um, so, as we were chatting, you said your background so random. So, give us some of your background. Yeah, so mine is, I started off, I guess, what, like I'm from Malaysia originally. My family immigrated in like 89, so I was a little kid at that point. Um, but I guess career-wise, I thought career plan A was to be a commercial pilot. Really? Um, so I was an air cadet. I did my commercial pilot's license. But then my parents are really traditional, I guess, <laughs> Chinese parents. So their whole thing was like, no, no, you have to have a university degree. You have to go to university. And so I was... I kind of figured out a plan that I would go to Moncton Flight College, hmm. which is one of the largest commercial trainers in Canada, yeah. and go to Mount Allison. Yeah. But I had never actually visited the campus or anything. I was just looking at like all yeah. the schools and being the one that's English and isn't religious. Good. Yeah. <laughs> We're there. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. And so that was kind of like the start of everything. Yeah. And then somehow the road kind of weaved into the startup and entrepreneurship world. Can we explore the pilot stuff a little bit? Yeah, um, totally. What what inspires that the sensation of being in the air? Um, job security because there's a shortage of pilots. Eh? Um, it's kind of funny because I think when I first started learning to fly, I couldn't drive yet, so I would have been 16 or 17 when I got my glider <laughs> pilot's license. Very cool. And did you do that here? I did it in. Uh, I was an air cadets yeah. in triple three here, um, but I did my glider license at the gliding school in Debert. So it's the Atlantic Gliding School. So. Yeah, through so, the air cadets. Oh, I want to explore that. So is that like what we see in the movies? Because sometimes there's a scene in the movie, uh, Thomas Crown Affair, for example, and they're just gliding along. And it, it's so sensual and so much fun, it seems. So is that uh, indicative? Is that what it's like? Yeah, like to some extent, for sure. Because it's like most gliders, like there's no engine. There's some motorized one, but the ones that I fly don't have an engine. So yeah. when once you get pulled up and then you release from the rope, it's just smooth sailing. Yeah. Like a lot of people compare it to sailing because it's just quiet. All you hear is the wind noise okay. and you're in control so, of everything. So then how do you know where the swells are to keep you up there? Um, you've got like a, you got a vertical speed indicator. So you can kind of see if there's thermals here that kind of pop up okay. all together. Um, if you're experienced, you can kind of, let's say I've never done mountain soaring, but if you do mountain soaring, there's certain parts of the mountain that there's going to be updrafts and uplifts. So yeah. you kind of got that combination too. Fun. So a 16 year old pilot, that's, yeah, you'd be one of a kind in a way, wouldn't you? There, it's, it's unique for sure. But yeah. I think it's like the cadet program is such an amazing program that like it taught me so much growing up. Cause you, you join it when usually you're about 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And so all the leadership skills, learning how to teach all these different things kind right. of get thrown at you. Okay. So. So I don't want to stay stuck on the pilot, but how, how cool. So are you a licensed pilot now? Yep. So I did my glider pilot's license. <clears throat> Excuse me. <It's> okay. <laughs> uh, glider pilot's license. Then I did my private pilot's license. And then I did my um, commercial pilot's license. And then I'm a glider instructor through the cadet program. So I'm still a reservist within the military, but I just mm. help out with the cadet program. It's kind yeah, of the you, you just mapped out a whole career right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, holy moly, how much can you pack into a year or two years? <laughs> More than that. Yeah. Um, so then you said your, your world took a turn. Uh, one of the pleasures of the show is to interview a wide range of people. Um, sometimes they're seniors. One of the questions to ask a senior is, what are the moments in your life where things took a turn? Um, same thing applies for younger people. Um, older people will look back and, and see different key points in a life and go, man, if I had chosen this instead of chosen that. And, and it'll have an impact on their life and they've got the hindsight element to it. You still have some of the foresight element to it where, now I'm gonna go after this now or I'm gonna go after that now. So what took you away from being a pilot and into something else? I think the big thing that I start to notice was 
compared to all my friends. And I would say 70% of my friends now are pilots. Um, a good chunk, maybe not 70, maybe 60 now. Hmm. But every single one of them was excited to fly an F-18 or fly a 747 <laughs> or anything like that. And I was like, can I fly a glider? <laughs> can I make money off that? Not really. And so I think my driver for why I want to fly was a lot different. Yeah. Um, I don't, I've told my friends this before, but a lot of people think, oh, being a pilot is so glamorous and it's amazing to travel yeah, yeah, yeah. and movies. Yeah. And it's, yeah. and to some extent, yeah, it is like, it's incredible. Your responsibility that you have to have and do like that you have in your hands is huge. Yeah. Yeah. But for me, it was like, I'd rather be a bus driver right. because at least being a bus driver, I could talk to people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, being a sure. pilot meant that I would be stuck beside someone for yeah. like for hours on end and only that one person, maybe two. And I can't even choose who that person is that sits beside me because it's created by some scheduler. And so it just wasn't really the world I want to live in. So I kind of just thought about it as a hobby. Yeah. Spent all the money. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. But it's more than a hobby. It'll be interesting to interview you 30 years from now and see if you loop back. Yeah. Because it's in your bones. <laughs> um, have to ask this Richard Bach stuff. Do, have you ever read any Richard Bach stuff about flying? No, I haven't. Okay. Oh, well, if I've got an extra copy, I'll, so, I'll give you one. No, we can do it later. <laughs> sure. Um, yes, he's got one called Illusions, Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah. And the two main characters in the book uh, fly biplanes and they're barnstorming around. So oh, cool. there's a mysticism to his stuff that maybe you'll enjoy. So you left being a pilot. Um, and took on what next? I was, so I graduated from Mount A, and then I was kind of in this, like, not really quite sure what I wanted to do. Yeah. A lot of my friends at Mount A had gone into, like, banking or Maple Leaf Foods or Irving, like, Business these large, thing. yeah, like, large businesses. But I was just like, I'm not ready for it yet, because I looked at my career, my, like, career, beginning of my career at that time, and I thought, okay, I'm, like, 22 right now. If I retire at 65, I have 40-some years to work. Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> why would I jump into something right away? Yeah. And so one night, I literally just Googled international volunteer, ex affordable international volunteer experiences. And really? just Googled it. I was like, okay, because a lot of the ones I found were like $10,000 for two weeks <gasps> to go volunteer. Wow. Um, but one of the pages that I stumbled upon was uh, Canada World Youth. Oh, yeah. And so I ended up applying for it. I got accepted. And so that <laughs> fall, after I taught gliding and stuff for the summer, which was like my summer job yeah. for a couple years, yeah. I went to Peterborough for three months for the Canadian portion and then went to Tanzania for three months. Right. And so that was kind of my first kind of real experience living overseas as like, not as a kid, but like as an adult. Yep. Uh, but it kind of gave me a different appreciation of almost like when we complain about things back <laughs> home, it's like, okay, this is like seriously a first world problem. Like, why are we even yeah. having this conversation? Yeah. Um, was kind of that reality check I got. Um, and so that kind of opened my eyes and then I came back, which was a whole other crazy chapter, yeah. <laughs> um, where I called it my quarter, like my almost quarter life crisis. Cause I was about 23 at that time. <laughs> and so... Girl, how much can you pack <laughs> into a few years? Goodness. But, but in a way you're also an example. Um, one of the narratives of the show is to create a space for all of the good things that happen in New Brunswick. Um, with that sometimes comes, how do you butt up against the negative or the critical side? Mm -hmm. So two themes would be fun to explore is one, uh, young people don't have drive or energy. It's just, it's like, <laughs> no, watch Sally, you know, and two is, um, they can't make a career here. All young people mm -hmm. need to leave to go. So here you are, you're back from Canada world youth, you're 23, 24, having a first quarter crisis. <laughs> so how did you get through it then? For me, I don't think it was, <clears throat> I don't think it was the environment that I couldn't make a career in. So it wasn't New Brunswick. I think it was me not knowing what I wanted to do in life. That makes more sense. Was the bigger thing. Um, because like I, anyone that knows me knows that I love to travel and like, I have my little like hit list of number of countries and <laughs> things like that. And it was that I wasn't really quite sure at that point what would make me tick and what kind of environment I wanted. So is it that I want to work for a not-for-profit? Is it that I want to work for a Fortune 500 company? Yeah. Or do I want to work for government? I had never actually thought about that. Yep. And so I was in this point of like, oh my God, it's like adulting 101. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> and that was what I was kind of going through. So I, I ended up actually living out in Edmonton for a month with my brother. Hmm. 
who's 11 years older than me, and he was like, there's more jobs in Edmonton, out west, come out there. And so after Tanzania, I actually went straight there. I didn't even come home. Yeah. And, I, I was, and I tried. I was like, applied for a couple jobs, kind of got out there, and I just didn't like Edmonton. I it couldn't, it didn't really jive with me. Yeah. And so after a month, I still didn't have a job, um, but I had some money sort of saved up, and I had some friends in Moncton. Hmm. And I was like, let's just make, move, to get, move in together and live there. And so I did. And then I was like, I'll figure out the job thing after. Okay. And um, so things kind of slowly start to sort of piece together. And the first job, real job I took after school was um, running a fundraising initiatives for CNIB. Okay. Um, so Canadian National Institute for the Blind. Yep. And so I was responsible for Walter Gretzky Golf, Golf Classic to Dining in the Dark to... Yeah. Some of the major gifts projects. So you did some of that special event management stuff yeah. kind of on the fly. What's your degree in? Uh, I did commerce. Yeah. Okay. So it, it sort of fits. One of the typical questions is, you know, does your degree actually become applicable when you're in your mid thirties? You know, right. do you get to use it? Past guest on the show, um, who's the dean of arts at uh, at UNB, will talk with much enthusiasm about how an arts degree, liberal arts degree, actually sets you up quite well in probably your mid-30s for um, a career paths and things like that. <clears throat> but, so you've crammed an awful lot in already. <clears throat> Working in New Brunswick so far, is it, has it been okay? It's been amazing. If, if that makes sense. It, uh, I'll frame it a different way. There's so much opportunity in this little province because it's small and, and one person can have a much bigger impact, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, and people have impact no matter where they live, but in a population of 750,000, you can kind of be the first at doing some stuff that nobody else is doing. And you seem to have a series of firsts. Yeah. Well, I think the one of the biggest benefits, it's like a lot of people say it's like, oh, it's three degrees of connection. It's like, no, it's one degree of yeah. connection. It's so, not even that. Yeah. So I find that I've been lucky enough and for, grateful enough, uh, super grateful that Anything I've ever wanted to do, I'd be, I'll ask one person and be like, do you happen to know someone that does this? Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, yeah, you should talk to so-and-so. Yeah. And so these linkages always start to happen. I think one of the best experiences that I had actually was during school. That kind of gave me this reality check to some extent was that we were fourth year commerce students. Three of us got forced into a group together for this class that was called um, Venture Capital Finance Innovation. And it was it was a it was a guinea pig class. We were the first year, and our prof had basically matched us up with a chemistry professor and forced us to do the market research, do the strategic plan, write a business plan for it. And on top of it, we had to compete in the NBIF Breakthrough Competition, the New Brunswick Innovation Foundation yep. Breakthrough. And so we did it. And the crazy thing was was that we won it at the end of like yep. at the comp at the end of the competition. But the three of us had never thought about entrepreneurship in any way, shape, or form. Okay. We um, so experiential learning. Yeah. Oh, totally. But we had won one hundred twenty-five thousand, and it was just and like you'd think it's like oh somebody <laughs> just gave you one hundred twenty-five thousand you'll do something with it. The three of us were like mm, not really. One guy worked for Scotia Bank. One went to work for Nestle. I went to Tanzania, and I think for <laughs> us at that point it was just like. We couldn't quite see the potential of the company yeah. because we, at that point, I'd say we were pretty negative in the sense of we can't do this in New Brunswick. So eh, let's just go do our other thing. We'll yeah. get other jobs or other experiences yeah. elsewhere. Obvious question. What happened at 125,000? It went into the company. Yeah. So the company was Chem Green Innovation. Okay. And so I think they're still alive now and chugging along. Okay. Um, but yeah, the, the researcher and some of the other folks involved um, kind of pushed it forward. So the, is that what, uh, after you did your Tanzania exercise and the trip to Edmonton and you're back um, crashing with some buddies in an apartment, um, is that where you started to make your way into that IT world? Yeah. So I, I left CNIB. Actually, I, I only did a short stint there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually, I think it was like four months, <laughs> maybe mm -hmm. less than six months. Yeah. I just knew it wasn't Yep. really what I wanted to do. Yep. And so after that, I didn't have a job again. <laughs> so then this was like my almost a second phase of almost quarter life crisis because I think <laughs> I was 24 at the time. Yeah. Um, so I didn't work for about four months trying to figure things out. And then a really good friend of mine, uh, Scott York, he was working at like career services at Mount A and he wanted to go to this networking event. And him and I had played badminton and he kind of said to me, he's like, Sally, let's go to this networking event. You're good on your own. Just 
come and mix and mingle. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah. So I did. And I met uh, Doug Robertson and Barb Ells, who now work for Ben Innovation in Moncton. Okay. And it was called Tech Southeast at the time. I just had a quick little chat with them. And, and I wasn't looking for a job. I was just honestly just out there chit-chatting with people. Yeah. Two days later, I get a call from Doug being like, so are you still jobless? <laughs> mm -hmm. What are you doing right now? Mm -hmm. And I was actually going to go interview for one of the big banks at that time. And I said to him, I'm actually walking into an interview, but I'm downtown. So how about I drop by your office after the interview? Yeah. And funny story with the interview stuff, but I ended up, I didn't end up getting that job. And I walked into their office and he's like, I think we want to hire you. Not really quite sure what the title is. You tell me what the title is. But these are the things that we kind of want to do. And we think you could help. So can you figure it out? Um, and at that phase, it was getting kids interested in STEM careers. And STEM career is? Uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Very cool. And so they were part of, like, like Tech Southeast at the time had, like, probably 150 members, I would say, that are all made up of all tech companies, mostly. Mm -hmm. And they had partnerships with post-secondary institutions. And my job was to figure out how to connect it. Hmm. And it was awesome because I've been teaching kids with an air cadet. So I knew curriculum. I know how to handle a class. Yep. So it's this fun little mismatch of everything. And I spent probably about a year, a little over a year and a half yep. with them there. Did you ever come up with a job description? Yeah, I did. I think, <laughs> I think well, I was like, what was my title? I think it was like community engagement coordinator. It, it gets into that. <laughs> Something. Because you're mapping out. This is fascinating because you're mapping out the difference in the workplace. Yeah. Um, uh, most people are used tradi to traditional structure. There's your job description, there's your parameters, um, and then you fit into the pattern this way. What you just described is, we're not too sure what we're doing, and but we know we want it to go there, and, and you make up your own job description. And in some sectors, that is the new workplace. Yeah. Oh, totally. And I, I noticed probably like a year ago that I realized every single job I've pretty much always done, I've been the guinea pig in. <laughs> like people <laughs> love hiring me to be like, kind of have this vague idea of what we want. Now you go figure it out, Sally. Here's your budget. Here's your <laughs> rough timeline. Yeah. You tell us. And I love that mm. um, versus I think some people just kind of panic or freeze. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, ooh, <laughs> mm -hmm. what's this little tinkering project? Yes, because you get to create. Yeah. Um, in a way, um, the whole province needs to do that. Um, some of the paradigms and the structures and models we've been using for 50 years don't work anymore. You can see all around us if you look through a certain lens how things are falling apart. Um, that's fun when it gets a little chaotic because new models can start to surface. And New Brunswick's quite well situated for breaking through some new models and it sounds like you sit in the middle of that dynamic. Yeah, it's, I think I do. Yeah. <laughs> I was like trying to tinker around with it for sure. Yeah, because you're so busy doing it. Um, Wander into the Planet Hatch stuff then, because mm -hmm. does that get, did that get you to Planet Hatch? Almost. Okay. <laughs> like and, and we're sort of, the arc we're doing here is like Sally Yang's, you know, career path thing. Which yeah. We sort of didn't know we were going to go that way, but you're also giving an audience an example of um, work opportunities for young people nowadays. Right. So there is a dual purpose to wandering down this road. Oh, yeah. Okay. So to kind of a short, long story short, I guess. One of the projects I did with Tech Southeast was interviewing cool CEOs to showcase, hey, they're not just guys, they're not just overweight men with glasses that oh, work in tech. Oh, that hurts. Um, well, it was because <laughs> there was a research study from the States that came out at that point where yeah. they asked kids, what do you think a tech person looks like? Oh, yeah. And okay. they drew overweight white guys sure. with glasses. And so I was doing this like little video <laughs> series at the time. And one of the guys I interviewed was Dan Martell. Okay. And so Dan's like a very notable entrepreneur, like multiple acquisitions. He's from Moncton. After I interviewed him, he sends me an email and says, why aren't we working together? And I was like, uh, um, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. And so we end up going for coffee. And two weeks later, I quit Tech Southeast and then ended up working with him at Clarity. Mm -hmm. And so, and that was like a crazy roller coaster um, at the time. Cause I think we were at, I want to say 15,000 users. I think we we're in 38 countries at the time. Okay. And Clarity was this 911 for entrepreneurs type of platform where okay. you could call up anyone. And after that, like it wasn't really, I was just drinking from a fire hose. And so I remember my relationship with like, Dan was really good. And Dan kind of said to me one time, he's like, Sally, I know you're not happy. Like, what do you miss? And I said to him, I miss the community aspect. I'm talking to all these entrepreneurs that are in San Francisco and Dubai and Shanghai. 
but I've never actually gotten a chance to see these startup communities before. Mm. So I feel like I'm kind of a fraud, is what I said to him. He's like, I have an idea. And he was on the advisory board for Startup Weekend. And so one call from him to one of the senior guys at Startup Weekend got me in as a facilitator. And so really quickly, I ended up getting plopped. I think LA was one, Cincinnati was the next, Toledo was the next. He realized that I was way happier doing that. And like, it wasn't quite the right fit. And so after that, I basically didn't work for 11 months and went volunteering for Startup Weekend. And I did, I think, nine countries. Or I did 11 countries in nine months. And on top of it, because I have a flying background, one of my best friends uh, flew for Cathay Pacific and she didn't have a boyfriend at the time. So I got her flight passes <laughs> <laughs> so I could go from yeah. New York to Hong Kong business class for 200 bucks. Wow. And so I was just like, I'm not working for the next year. Let's put that timeline. And yeah. I just volunteered to facilitate events as like everywhere I possibly could just to understand what what's making all these other communities tick. It's almost like field research yeah, in a way. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm thinking some of the audience might not know what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> right? It's a quite. It's like if I was talking to a football player and they're talking about the playbook, right? And it's like, oh, I sort of get the gist of what Sally's riffing about. So how do you explain to people who don't know what IT is or startups are or are half that language that you use? How do you ground it so that they get the picture of what you're talking about? Because in a way, when David Alston was on the show, and even Greg Hemmings to a degree when he was on the show, um, they're so immersed in that culture and so animated about it, just like you are. But we'll read in mainstream media sometimes about the IT world, um, acquisitions, startups, um, cash outs, all that new language in a way. And But most of the province is still steeped in a traditional industrial or agrarian or mm -hmm. farming culture. So do you have a way of bridging this new economy thing? And, and what does it look like? So I get up in the morning and I'm talking to 15 people from worldwide, you know, is that it? And then people will go, how do you make money doing that? Or how is that a business? Right. Can you wander us into some of the nuts and bolts or if I asked too, too odd a question? Yeah, no, no, I think it totally makes sense because we do, we're kind of stuck in our own little bubble. When I think of the word startup, I think of it as that temporary phase of a business. It's that first couple maybe a couple months, maybe it might be a first couple years, but it's when that business is just trying to figure out what's repeatable and scalable. Once it's figured that out, it's like, okay, we know how to make money now. Okay. <laughs> and you kind of advance out of that startup phase. So that business isn't a hardware store? No. no. So what kind of business? So let's say, let's say Clarity, for example. So when we were for Clarity, we were trying to figure out what, like, Dan's mindset was that if an entrepreneur wants advice, they shouldn't be going to, going to their mom or dad for advice. They're not the best people. You should be able to go to the Dragons of Dragons Den or Mark Cuban or whoever, like all these notable people, mm -hmm. plus really experienced business folks. But the issue is, is that most entrepreneurs can't access them. And so Clarity was, in some sense, a database online of all these business experts that anyone could just call up and pay by the minute to chat with. Okay. And so we as the startup were figuring out, okay, how do we charge for that? Do we let do we let the expert p fix the rate, pick the rate or do we what percentage do we take? How do we market it out there? Mm -hmm. Those were all the questions that we didn't really know. So we're kind of figuring it out. Like for any startup, you have to do that because you don't know what works or what doesn't yet. You start with a hypothesis and yep. you're like, we'll put it up there. You might buy a billboard and be like, okay, that did nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you had to take risk. Right, exactly. So I think that's a big piece of the mindset of a startup. Mm -hmm. With Startup Weekend, it's this massive global organization that's part of Techstars. And they're a huge organization that helps to incubate um, a lot of technology companies around the world. Okay. And what is huge? Um, well, they probably, oh, like, over a hundred, like Startup Weekend is in a, over 120 countries, um, over 1,500 cities. Okay. Um, hundreds and thousands of participants and organizers have taken part in it. And then the actual Techstars program is in Dubai, it's in India, it's in like six different locations in the US. Like, I don't know exactly how many, but yeah. there's quite a few. Is it in Canada as well? Yeah, they just launched their first Techstars cohort actually in Toronto. Okay. And so they're just recruiting companies now. And so, but with Startup Weekend, it's this early stage um, program that they have, which is a 54 hour experience. So 
everyone probably knows of someone that has an idea but is like scared to work on it or they've been they'll say they've been tinker, tinkering around mm. for it for about six months well yeah so these ideas i'm just trying to ground it totally. for the audience you know so these ideas the an example of an idea would be is it apps is it all based on you know social media or internet world stuff or is it based in i want to start a farm it could be both okay yeah it's just that because traditionally it started from the tech you send you tend to see a lot more tech ideas okay. so that's that's the difference in some sense but one idea that came from startup weekend locally in new brunswick is hotspot parking so they actually won the very first startup weekend competition that we had here about three four years ago yeah altogether because literally friday night it has to be a pre-developed idea so you it's not something that you've worked on for six months it's just that thing in your head you have one minute to pitch it all the participants vote on the ideas and then you kind of weed them down and then after that teams form sort of organically so if you pitched idea i might be like well i'm a marketing person and mm. i like your idea can i join your team mm. and once your teams form you have mentors that roam around they have to get out and talk to potential customers so we call it customer validation then by sunday they pull together a pitch they might have gotten a prototype together and they pitch in front of judges kind of like dragon's den style Yep. A little nicer than Dragon's Den. <laughs> um, but yeah, but the whole thing is to show them what they could do in 54 hours hmm. to create action. So like a tagline is uh, no talk, all action. <laughs> yeah. Is what we always kind of say. And that has happened in Fredericton or in New Brunswick? Yeah, we've done, I think, nine of them. We just had one in St. John <coughs> last weekend. Okay. And then we have one in Fredericton, November 3rd to 5th. Okay. Yeah. Um, if there's online information, we could put that in the show and in the tags underneath. Yeah, okay. that'd be awesome. So is this an example of New Brunswick's potential for a new economy? Do you see it as being one of those drivers? When Dave Alston was here, um, I wanted to play with uh, what percentage of the economy is that. So I want to expand it bigger. Media will give a lot of attention to tech startups. Um, Radiant 6, of course, earned all kinds of attention when it got its cash out. Um, so what percentage would be farming, fishing, forestry, industrial, and then tech? Mm -hmm. And does tech have the potential, from your point of view, to help fill, you know, job opportunities for New Brunswickers or become our new identity 20, 25 years from now? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's this cute little province that no one knows about with this amazing trail system and amazing nature. And they've got this IT culture down there that's just flying. Farming has started to come back. Um, some of the industrial model stuff has gone away and they figured out their transition for the next 50 years. Is that kind of, did I go too, too big with that? Because there's a role for people like you and your th that work culture to have an impact on the province. Right. But oh, most of us don't know it. Yeah, so I would say, I don't know if it's necessarily a new economy. I think it's just a different way of doing things now. Okay. So I think, for every type of industry and every business, no matter if it's a bookstore to if it's a farm to if it's a tech company, tech is the backbone of everything. It, in my opinion, it has to be hmm. right from everything of how you handle your transactions to how you invoice to how you file your CRA claims, tax claims and all the things like that. Hmm. So I think to me, I don't necessarily see tech as a separate industry per se. It's the it's like the piece of paper that all of us use. And I think for us to be successful as as New Brunswick or any region, we have to keep that in mind. Um, it's the way I look at it. So even like with farmers, I have a friend, uh, Beth Dishbande and Nick, uh, Nick Claremont. They uh, started a company called Soma Detect and they test mastitis in cows, cow's milk, which is some sort of bacteria disease that cows have that reduce the amount of fat in milk. And it's super techie <laughs> like she's got a phd her dad like had this idea and had patented uh, but now they are visiting farms and they're rubber boots all the time so it's almost like you look at dairy farmers and how they're getting infused with technology and what that means it makes them a lot more effective it reduces the disease with the cows gives mm. cows a better life mm. makes bigger profits mm. so i think in today's world it's that tech has to be infused for us to have that sort of next industrial age, I guess you could mm. say. Mm. Great answer. Thank you. That, that's, that's really clear. The audience will go, oh, that's what she's talking about, which is awesome. Um, which almost leads to another area to go explore, which is coding. 
Um, because there's some who think that, and with much passion, that coding should be in schools so mm -hmm. that people know coding. Is it my layman not understanding there's a connection between coding and that story you just told us of, of tech application into farming? Um, so do you, or that piece of paper analogy that you gave, this is the piece, it's what interconnects all the pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so do we need to start putting coding in school, do you think? so that we're okay for what's coming 10 or 15 years from now or I think, two years from now? Absolutely. Yeah. I think we need it now. Yeah. <laughs> I think we needed it, honestly, like five years ago. Okay. Because um, I'll tell you why. Like, I, I love working with new grads, and I've hired a lot over the years, and I have a couple working with me right now. And they're amazing people, and they're super driven, and they're ambitious. But they need to have that ability to kind of integrate a lot of our systems, let's say platforms. So you could have your social, let's say they're a marketing student, they could be using Hootsuite, that you could be using a video platform, but I need them to pull all the data into one like dashboard, I guess you could say. Yep. I'm showing them basics of Excel to do that or Google Sheets. And you might think, well, Excel's not really um, a code, like that, that's yeah. not computer coding, but it is when it comes to algorithms and formulas. Okay. So I think it's that, if we start to teach kids some of that backbone, they're less intimidated by these other aspects uh, okay. that they'll have. And they can start to pull things together. Cause now it's like, like I know for me, I probably easily spend $3,000 a year on software, right? Like, and like compared to some of my other friends, like that's on the low end, but all these software need to talk to each other. And you don't necessarily need a developer to do that. You just need someone that understands how these systems work mm -hmm. that can kind of create this little dashboard. Mm -hmm. And what I'm noticing with a lot of the new grads is that they're looking at me, they're like, they see the value in it and they see why we need to, but it's the first time they've ever even experienced it in any sort of way. And I'm like, we're not setting you up to be successful. If this is, if this is your adulting 101 chapter one, <laughs> like, and you've never even ever seen it. Yeah. There's something wrong with that. Yeah. I think we're not preparing them for what, really what businesses and organizations need. So coding into school system becomes important. Where does that start for you? Does it start um, right away in elementary school? Does it start in middle school? Um, we have the French immersion debate that constantly flips around because politics gets in the way of uh, delivery of a service. So French immersion should be grade one. No, it should be grade five. No, it should be grade three. Um, is there a clarity for those who know that the direction should be at this age group is where we're supposed to introduce mm -hmm. these skill sets? Right. And I'm, I'm not an education expert by any means, mm -hmm. but I kind of look at it as, let's say you're training an athlete altogether. Okay. You might see, okay, that kid has like a potential to be, I don't know, Olympian runner. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't start them running ridiculous long distances on day one. You kind of start to ease them into it yeah. over time. I think with coding, it's the same way. You don't teach them you you'd probably need to teach them logic hmm. before so with anything from blocks of just being like, okay, if you take this block and put it here, what's the next block you're going to have? Okay. If you push this button, what happens? You have to start to kind of give them that foundation before you give them the nitty gritty of these are the formulas or these are the short keys. And this is what a dash and yeah. means. And well, in some ways that that kind of exists, just playing with Lego alone is a way of sequencing or constructing three dimensionally, you know, totally. Um, you use the word coding. It might be some people, including me, don't know what that means. Can you give us a peek into the nuts and bolts of what that looks like? Yeah. So um, is You said dashes and dots and stuff. Is literally that it? Some of it is. So there are, like, I, I actually can't code. Okay. I'm, I lead the ladies learning code chapter, but I'm the logistics coordinator. And yeah. I bring in the experts to do it. Yeah. When it comes to coding, it's that there's hundreds of different languages to code. So you've got Ruby on Rails, you've got C++, you've got HTML. Yeah. These are some of the buzzwords that you'll hear. Yeah. And each of these languages do different things. So if you're building, let's say a mobile app mm. or a cell phone app, you'll need these languages. If you're building a website, you're going to need these languages. A lot of developers, um, some of them are, we call them like they're full stacked. So they know kind of a combination of everything. Full stack. <laughs> yeah. It's a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> full stack. That's what, uh, that's what they call it. It's like, you'll see job descriptions say, say hiring for a full stack developer. <laughs> and so that's kind wow. of like developers that know everything or a back end. So like they know more of the back end stuff. Maybe yeah, yeah. the things that don't look as pretty front end is someone that looks like 
makes like as building the grunts of the site or app that people are seeing yep. firsthand. So I think with coding, there's all these different pieces with it, but it's kind of the combination of all the tasks and jobs that they need to pull together to make an app or a site um, is the way I always kind of try to explain coding. <laughs> yep. no, makes sense. Um, it's just trying to give little peeks into the different um, subculture almost of the IT world. Um, so then um, lead us into the Planet Hatch world because um, we were slowly working our way yeah. there about 20 minutes ago. Because um, you, you were, as best I my research on you showed, is that there's a connection between um, Sally Yang and Planet Hatch and how it got going. And then there was a parting of the ways, I guess, which from your story, there's constantly like, do this for a while, do this for a while, do this for a while. Which is also for what it's worth, uh, fits perfectly with Richard Florida's uh, work on the creative class mm -hmm. that he did 15, 18 or so years ago about the next generation work for a different um, purpose. Right. And, and your classic example of what he talked about, which which is great because there's more than just work. You know? Yeah, totally. Um, it was... So the Planet Hatch world. Yeah, mm. so like I ended up coming home after all the Startup Weekend stuff and they happened to be building this thing. And it wasn't called Planet Hatch at the time. It was called C-E-A-L-T, C -E -A -L -T, which stood for Commercialization Environment for Advanced Learning and Technologies. <laughs> was the name and so they had posted the job a friend of mine was like sally you should apply and i'm like what are they doing oh i guess i'll go chat with them about it and yeah. i applied for the job and they were literally looking to build a physical space they wanted to have an accelerator and i had literally just come back from seeing i think 25 some spaces and accelerators and and i knew new brunswick and i knew the east coast so it was sort of a perfect mix i guess mm -hmm. in that way and it was a crazy roller coaster because for me, I think I was, I think I had just turned 25 or 26 at the time, roughly. And I'd never handled a budget really at that capacity. Mm -hmm. I had never handled a construction project and it was 8,000 square feet. So literally things I had to do was pick the furniture, work with the construction folks, work with the interior designer, all of that getting pulled together. And we had a COA funding. So I'd never dealt with like government funding before. So it was this crazy mashup of everything. Adult 101. Yeah, exact 2.0. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, it totally was. And I remember even one of the funny things during that first few months was I was doing the construction project and I was over budget. And I went to go talk to my boss, uh, Larry Shaw at the time. And I said to him, I was like, I was like, oh my God, like, what do I do? Like, and he's like, how much, how over budget are you? And I said to him, I'm like, I don't know, like 10%, maybe like maybe 8%. And he's like, okay, so what do you want to do about it? And, and and before he said that, he's also said, that's okay. Ten, eight to 10% is like normal for a construction project, not the end of the world. But what are you going to do about it? So I said to him, oh, I think I can cut some, every power outlet is about $130 or something like that. I'll cut those. And he's like, that's a lot of outlets to cut yeah. <laughs> and to make the impact. Yeah. And I was like, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was almost... you're wheedling your way through, like right. trying, trying to find where is that point it solves it exactly but you like you for me at that time i was like i had never handled anything so i'm just i'm being reactive versus actually taking a step back and thinking what's going to have the biggest impact you needed to call that service that you were working for three years before you <laughs> talked to experts in different fields right? yeah totally yeah so but that, that was the thing it's like you had all this like craziness that came up yeah. from it but it was incredible like it was probably one of the defining jobs i've had i guess my first 10 years of my career yeah. where like everything was from scratch like there wasn't really a playbook to some extent yeah. and so it was again I was tinkering in this world and people were just like oh you'll figure it out and so we ended up doing I think like over 100 events a year um, we had two like in the first year we had 11 companies come through the cohort so we had like Resin Aerospace, MicoDev, Hotspot Parking, Timber Cases, um, Eigen Innovations, like we had so many awesome companies come through our yep. doors yep. Um, and some of the entrepreneurs I had actually gone to high school with, yep. which was kind of funny yeah. that way. So when you talk about these companies come through your doors, um, what kind of, not what do they do? I'm wondering how many employees. So when you say company, there's a whole range of description that fits under the word company. Um, so are they two or three people? Is it just one person? Is it 150 people? 
Right. These were early, early stage companies, so startups. So I would say most of them were like two person companies. Occasionally they had three, occasionally you had a one person company, mm -hmm. but we usually took in companies that were at least two because we knew like if you're a one person company, you can't have that, like it's too much work to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you need another partner in crime to kind of help you push things forward. Mm -hmm. So most of them, I would say two. So is the intent from this whole process to create the seedlings almost of these ideas to formalize into companies that then have the potential to become bigger? Exactly. Yeah. And I always like that was one big piece. The other side was that typically entrepreneurs that they're tinkering, tinkering around, like if you talk to the David Alstons and the Marcells, it's like they're hiding in their basement doing this thing and they can't really get out in public. And so part of it was that we want to take these entrepreneurs out of the basement, hmm. put them in a area or community where they'll have these collisions where they they get to talk to each other yep. but we can bring in mentors we can bring in service providers we can bring in the outside community mm -hmm. to kind of understand what they do uh, bigger and better mm -hmm. and faster mm -hmm. is the big piece and then uh, so planet hatch it morphed into something else with ignite Fredericton, didn't it yeah no it did Okay. Are there other versions in Moncton and St. John, or is it just here? Um, Planet Hatch, every, I'd say every center is, has their own little quirks and everyone's set up differently. Okay. But St. John, you've got Connection Works, okay. but you've also got the Impact Hub okay. as well. That's more focused on the social side. And then in Moncton, you've got Connection, uh, not Connection Works, you've got uh, Venn Center. Halifax, you've got Volta, and you've got uh, Innovacore as well. In PEI, you have Startup Zone, which I was helping out with. Is there ever any talk of doing this in northern New Brunswick? There has been lots. And a lot of people actually, when I was at Planet Hatch, would come down and do little visits. Like I had folks from Edmonston and Bathurst come down um, to chat with me about it. Okay. And I know the mayors of Edmonston and Bathurst fairly well because they'd, they always kind of poke at me and be like, Sally, what do you think of this? Yeah. Or if I see other articles about how to build a startup community, I usually try to send it their way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they want to. And I think there's slightly different versions of it. Like Miramichi has something in the works from what I hear, but it's it's hard to get that critical mass, yes. right? Like to build a community, you can't build a community with two people. Okay. So can, can you do the online version? Is that the same or do they physically need to be in the same space? I think you can do some online pieces, but I think there's like a magic with in person that yep. you can't really replicate online. Yep. Um, it's like that we're just going for coffee and be like, oh, how's your day going? Oh, I can see that you're maybe upset or happy. Yep. <laughs> you can actually have those interactions versus online, it's more scheduled. Yep. So it's different. Like even if we were to do something online, I would still try to bring everyone together once a month somewhere hmm. is the mindset I, I'd yeah. go with. Yeah, because people need to contact with each other. Yeah. Um, different tack. Young person living in New Brunswick, making a career. Um, what are the biggest obstacles you've run into so far? Hmm. Do you mean soft skills or hard skills, or like yeah, wherever you want? Whether it's politics, whether it's um, education opportunities, whether it's uh, affordable housing. Um, the general narrative for New Brunswick is young people don't stay here. They need to go off and have their adventures. I've interviewed several people on the show now. Um, who are 35 and under, who are choosing to stay here because they really like it. Right. But along the way, they've had to overcome some obstacles because they're kind of swimming against the current from what the mainstream media narrative is that young people lead. The reality is, no matter if you're in Quebec, Manitoba, BC, people, young people will leave. They have to go have their adventures. But it's fascinating to talk to the ones that chose to stay and are making their way here and that finding... Um, little magical moments because there's things you can do here that you couldn't if you're in Montreal or if you're in Toronto because of the scale. So. Right. But I'm more curious about this time anyway about the obstacles. Do you find any obstacles to living here? There definitely are. Like and I think there's two sides. There's sort of like the employee, like the young person themselves and the challenges they have, but then challenges that are almost influenced, I guess you could say, by the employer side or the rest of the community. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll cover the youth side first. Like I had a friend a couple years ago um, that was from Moncton and she she was like, I hate Moncton. I'm getting out of here. I'm taking a job. I'm taking an accounting job in Toronto. And so she did. Um, and I said to her, I was like, why? Like, why are you doing that? Like your cost of living is going to be so much higher. And I was like, there's this person you can talk to and this person. And she got mad at me and said, Sally, everything just works out for you. She's like, I'll just be fine. She's like, it's not that easy to find a job. She kind of 
and I, I took... Well, you had to admit, from the story you've shared so far, things have fallen to you. Like, there's something that just happens for you. To, yeah. So interesting, your friend sees that and goes, Sally. <laughs> right, and, and I, I haven't talked to this friend in a long time, and but it was... But I got really mad about it, and I was just like, what do you mean? Like, it doesn't just happen. Like, because there's a lot of... I, I'd say there's pieces of luck and coincidence and all that, hmm. but overall... If somebody asked me, hey, Sally, how many like networking events do you go to? How many things do you Im involve yourself in the community? I'd be like, I can list you off a huge list. Yeah. And I think it's because of those that have provided me the opportunity and sort of those connections for other stuff that I've done. Hmm. If you're if you're a young person and the only thing you've ever done is school, yes. sorry, everywhere else in the country, in the world, they have that. So it's like one of the biggest issues that I have with a lot of new grads is that they're like, yeah, I don't have like no one wants to hire me. Well, I'm like, have you volunteered anywhere? They Or they'll be like, yeah, I don't really know how to use Excel or I don't really know how to use social media. Or they say they want to do social media. And I'm like, that's great. So what have you done? So I can't, I don't always want to hire you to be the guinea pig. If this is the first time you're handling social media, either one, you're going to get a, get a lower salary. Or two, I'm not going to hire you. Mm -hmm. Or three, maybe if I have the capacity in my company, I'll try to train you. Mm -hmm. But realistically, if I was a new grad and I want social media, I'd go volunteer for some not-for-profit or charity and actually help them out with their campaign or yeah. event. Yeah. But what I find is that a lot of the new grads, like I, and I've interviewed six of them the last little while, within the last three months, actually, a lot of them don't have that. Hmm. And so it's not, they can't just blame the system. Yeah. You kind of need to look at your own skills in that way um, because some of the new grads, I think, need to get pushed a little bit more. Yeah, and maybe they just weren't exposed to it because all they've known is school. Exactly. Yeah. So it's an interesting mix. What about for you? Um, I want to turn it. You, you went job route. And I'm thinking, yeah, but what about the other things? You know, um, young, female, living in New Brunswick, um, housing. Uh, do you like the quality of life here? Are there things to do here? One of the things you get a lot about in the runs, there's nothing to do there. Um, depending on your mindset, if you're an outdoor enthusiast, there's all kinds of stuff to do here. But that's another story. So what's your experience been with living here separate from work? All the other things separate from work. Mm -hmm. Food tends to be a big one. You've traveled a lot food you know in New Brunswick and we do have our version of food but it's not international no and every time like anytime I go to Toronto or Edmonton to see my brother my luggage coming back is half food okay and literally it is and like my dad like my parents are still in Fredericton and my dad will get me to buy like pecking duck okay. and barbecue duck and barbecue pork okay. for him so definitely there's those pieces that I miss a lot of mm -hmm. but the rest of it like, for example, when my husband and I got married uh, two, yeah, two, a little over two years ago. Remember Sally? <laughs> yeah, I'm bad with the dates on some <laughs> things like that. He, uh, we decided, well, he wanted to get a boat. And one of his friends was getting rid of a boat. And so we bought a boat. Yeah. We went cheap on our wedding. Money went to this boat. And we have it parked right at the lighthouse, right in downtown Fredericton. So we could literally take a lunch break and just pop on the river. Like, I don't think you can quite do that in Toronto. If you did, it'd probably cost you $10,000 for docking fees alone. Yes. Right? So I think there's those pieces that we absolutely love. Mm -hmm. um, like, one of my goals was to get to 30 countries before I hit 30. And so I travel a lot. And I never... Like, traveling from East Coast, it's usually just one extra connection yes. going to Toronto. Yep. Otherwise, it's really no different than anywhere else. Yep. So to me, I don't see living on the East Coast as that big of a barrier. Because <clears throat> we get to travel. <coughs> it's okay. Excuse me. Take your time. Let's try. <laughs> we get to, um, like, we get to travel. Like, we go kite surfing. So you can go up north. You can go to Capolet. You can go to Shediac or PI. Yep. Everything that we want to do is here. It's just that, in some sense, it, like, some people are like, oh, you can go down south and it's summer all the time. But I'm like, that's great. But then what about snowboarding? Yeah. I think you make your own experiences. And if you're just going to sit on your butt and complain, <laughs> then, well, guess what? Yeah, maybe you should go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's fascinating. Um, uh, we met last Saturday at the Day for the Ages in Moncton, and you were there working on a project in a way. Um, you want to share a bit of that? Yeah. So I started... 
I kind of end up in this by accident. So I've got two companies. <laughs> uh, we've had an hour of Sally's <laughs> ended up in this by accident. <laughs> right. There's a lot of accidents. Good accidents. Yeah, there are no coincidences, right? <laughs> right, totally. Um, so I have the company, The Triple Effect, and it has three buckets of the stuff I do. One piece is the entrepreneurship training and community development. One piece is corporate innovation, getting big companies to think like a startup. And the third one is DigiLearn, which is technology coaching for seniors which is why I was there at the Day of the Ages. Um, and I started it because I, I was in tech. I was facilitating a lot of um, events at the time, specifically Hacking Health. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of the guys, <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> your language is uh, Hacking Health. If you're paying attention, you'll understand what she means. Right. It's hacking into health knowledge. I right. Think. It's like taking the coding world of like the tech side and the entrepreneurship world and throwing it together, mm -hmm. but to sp solve problems in healthcare. So how do you turn that on its head? Mm. And so I was at this event and you had like this college, a university college student pitching an idea that he said, I have it. I want to build an app to get my grandmother to remember her medication. And I'm like, that's great. Can your grandmother download an app <laughs> or find her apps? And he's like, no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so your app is useless <laughs> to some extent, right? It's yeah. not going to actually do what you want it to. Mm -hmm. And so I kept on coming up, like coming across people like that, that right intentions, right spirit and passion around it, but execution kind of missing because of things that are out of their control. And at the same time, my dad just turned 70, my mom 64. Um, my sister had a baby about a year before this. And w my mom had gotten a cell phone about around that same time. And so she, it was her first iPhone, she was on it. Because my family's all over the place, like Malaysia, Edmonton, Toronto, yeah. we have a family WhatsApp group, which is a little messaging platform. And so when my sister had the baby, she posted a photo on the messaging group, hey, the baby's born, here's the photo, all that. My dad didn't really know that the baby was born until like several hours, probably even almost maybe a day later. No because one called him. <laughs> no, and he doesn't have a smartphone. He's also the one that a couple years back went into Rogers and bought 10 of the exact same phones. He bought out all the Nokia cell phones in Rogers. And so, and my dad's had a cell phone since the first cell phone, like the giant clunky black ones. Yep. He's always had one. And I asked him, I was like, why did you buy like these 10 yeah. phones? Yeah. And he's like, well, it keeps changing on me. And so I'm just, I like this one. I like the design of it. I know how to use it. Now that's, I have all of them. <laughs> that's exactly what you do when you find a favorite pair of shoes and you right. get a couple of extra pair because they're going to stop making them. And I like these ones. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> and so my dad was just funny in that way. But then I could see, but it's really hard to teach your parents how to use technology devices like personalities, get yep. in the mix and patience and all that. And there's also mindsets or frames because um, it's not intuitive. What we say intuitive, we think we know what it means, but no, it's in different for each person by definition. It's oh, like, totally. And people think it's like even teaching my mom with her iPhone. She kind of said to me one day, she's like, I'm on the phone with her. And she's like, how do I get out of this app? And I said to her on your iPhone, just press the home button. She's like, what's the home button? And I was like, okay, the one and only giant round button at the bottom. And this is me being frustrated with my mom because yep. it's hard teaching her. Um, so she presses it and then she's like, oh, it's talking to me. And I'm like, right, you turned on Siri. <laughs> like, hold it for half a second. <laughs> yep. And then you're where you need it to be. It's exactly like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's these little things would just kind of pop up. And then we, I had a neighbor that's 82 that we're really close to, uh, that my husband and I visit all the time. And two years ago, she would run across the street and be like, Sally, help me with my iPad. And I'd help her and it's all good. Yep. Fast track two years later, her and I are shopping on Amazon side by side before Christmas. <laughs> and she's like, what do you think of this shirt? Like, do you think my grandkids will like this? And you see the impact that technology has. And so the three buckets that you map this out with. So that third one's about, is it user interface for seniors on, on software or on tablets? Or? Not at all. It's specifically a uh, coaching. Oh. So it's think of Sylvan Learning, how Sylvan Learning teaches kids reading and math. Yep. DigiLearn is specifically helping seniors catch up with technology. Okay. So that's like my big, like we're not sustainable at this point. <laughs> so the little tinkering project. Yeah. But the mindset is that can we build a social enterprise like similar to how a Sylvan Learning helps kids that we can help seniors and make it a franchise model. Um, that's that piece of it. Mm. And then I have a lot of students right now. It's their, it's their part time job and they're the tech coaches. So we've got the curriculum laid out, but for these students, <coughs> they there's like issues around like ageism and like stereotypes that they have of what a 
83 year old is like and things like that so i part of it behind the scenes as well as getting the generations to kind of intertwine and learn from each other because the seniors are super happy when someone young is chatting with them and the the young folks are kind of forced to slow it down <laughs> which is ironic with me saying that <laughs> um but talking slower and speaking slower and all these pieces that i'm also kind of playing with uh, through digilearn that's fun well, we two minutes left. How do you want to end this? It's been fascinating. Thank you for wandering into where you wandered. How would you like to end this? I think for me, I never thought I would stay in New Brunswick. Hmm. And I've been extremely grateful. Every time I travel, I always have a new appreciation and always want to come back. Hmm. So I think that's one piece where when people think like the opportunities don't exist in our own backyard, I think it's literally one connection away. Hmm. And never hurts to just ask hmm. is a thing. I think my funny experiences and things by accident have literally just been because I've asked a question and someone has been like, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. And I just follow that path. Hmm. So I think the big picture is sort of just don't be afraid to ask and take that little windy path. <laughs> and go from there. Thank you so much for this. Thanks, Dennis. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's much fun. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. <laughs>